Hello, my name is Randall Joy Thompson, and I would like to welcome you to our presentation on our recently published book, Reimagining Leadership on the Commons, Shifting the Paradigm for a More Ethical, Equitable, and Just World. Challenges the world faces today demand that re we reimagine leadership by shifting our awareness to the global system as a whole, lead needed changes together with an inclusive ethical perspective, relate to each other and the environment with care and responsibility, and regenerate society to be more equitable and just, and the natural world to be more sustainable and nourishing. That is, we need a shift in our leadership paradigm. Our recently published International Leadership Building Association Building Leadership Bridges book, Reimagining Leadership on the Commons, Shifting the Paradigm for a More Ethical, Equitable, and Just World, edited by Devin Singh, me, Randall Joy Thompson, and Kathleen Curran, who's also in this presentation today, includes chapters by 38 authors who provide new models and approaches to leadership, as well as examples of well-functioning commons, which provide a way of self-organizing ourselves to work together to solve our most pressing problems. We are pleased that we have together today several authors from our book whose chapters raise important questions and provide excellent recommendations regarding leadership on the commons and also leadership in general. I'm pleased, as you can see on our slide, that we have authors, Dr. Kathleen Allen, Catherine Baird, Nancy Sayer, Gayla Napier, William Blake Willis, Katya Hleb, Jung Trang, um, Michael Carey, Patricia Clary, and co-editor Kathleen Curran, and who will discuss how a whole systems approach can lead to the regeneration of our society and environment, how ethical standards are collaboratively derived in commons, how communitas in the commons is built on trust and particular values, how responsible leadership towards stakeholders is a function of a communal culture, how the Jesuit educational commons has provided ethical education to marginalized groups around the world, how conveners ensure ethical solutions to global commons problems, and how corporate commons leadership is a viable hybrid approach. A number of definitions on the commons have been posited. According to me, as co-editor of the book, I see the commons as social systems comprised of self-organized communities of commoners who create and or use and or protect and or share natural, human-made or abstract commonwealth governed and sustained by the practice of commoning, which infuses the community with distinctive values, processes and actions that differ from those of the state and the private sector. Commons have existed since antiquity have community, as communities have gathered together to manage critical natural and human-made resources, such as water, land, forest, wildlife and fish, and certainly during feudal times, peasants shared the land and forest and other resources in order to farm and feed their livestock. The contemporary commons movement, which began in the 1990s, is associated with Nobel Prize winner economist Eleanor Ostrom of Indiana University. Ostrom disproved Garrett Hardin's theory as expressed in his famous article, The Tragedy of the Commons. Hardin argued that people would naturally destroy commonly shared land on which they were grazing their livestock by overgrazing it and not assuming responsibility for sustaining it. As Ostrom argued and proved with examples from around the world, Communities can in fact work together without government or private sector controls to manage shared resources without depleting them. They just need to communicate and agree how to work together. Ostrom identified eight design principles of stable common pool resource management, 
which briefly I'll go over them. They include clearly defining what the shared resources are, how they would be used and provided to the community of users, how to make decisions such that all the communities take all the community takes part in the decision making process, having uh, an effective monitoring system to ensure that users are accountable, sanctions in the case that users violate the rules, mechanisms of conflict resolution, self-determination of the community that's recognized by higher level authorities in society, and in the case of larger resources, having organizations of multiple levels of organizations in the government that are also working with the local community to ensure the proper use of the resources. Commons have become a critical topic in recent years because of the enclosure by the private sector of an increasing number of natural and human-made resources and the use of these resources for profit when people around the world consider them to be provided to all. Enclosure of resources for profit, such as water, have prevented millions of people around the world from having access to clean water. And enclosure of a number of other resources has contributed to the climate crisis. Furthermore, enclosures of information and knowledge has prevented people such as small farmers from accessing critical information that would allow them to increase their yields and enclosure of input such as seed through copyrights has wreaked havoc on farmers around the world. People want more control over their lives and access to natural and human made commonwealth that should be shared and, and governed responsibly and made accessible to everyone regardless of their socioeconomic status. Focusing on the commons requires that we challenge our values, our perspectives, and our awareness. And the chapters in our book explain in depth how by changing the way we see and act toward each other, we are capable of creating a new world. Leadership on the commons is an important process. However, it hasn't really been discussed in great depth by common scholars or activists. This is one of the reasons that we wrote this book. And we have today a number of authors, as I indicated, who will discuss various angles and perspectives on the common and leadership on the commons that are extremely important. I turn now to Dr. Kathleen Allen, author of chapter one, Leading Regenerative Systems, Evolving the Whole Instead of the Part. Kathleen. Thank you, Randall. It's a pleasure to be here. We've been running an experiment on how robust our current leadership and management theories have been over the last 120 years or more. The results are in and the application of these theories have demonstrated how flawed they are. The efforts of our current management and leadership have created a world that is more fragile, less resilient and de degenerative at the core Climate change alone is giving us feedback on how optimizing profit and short-term self-interest over the whole system has created significant problems for the future of the human race. It is time for a shift from degenerating models and theories that have, taught, that have been taught in our universities and embedded in our legal systems to new theories, practices, and thinking that we reflect a regenerative principles and outcomes. This will require us to shift our worldview on four dimensions. The first one is from closed systems to open systems. And we need to make this shift because our environment is filled with systems that continually bump into one another creating ripple effects of change through all of the connections that we have. Open systems are highly dynamic and can't be controlled like closed systems can. It is time to let go of the myth of control. Control over nature, people, resources have led us to the illusion that we can control the future when nature is clearly sending a very different message. 
we also need to shift from short-term thinking to long-term thinking because long-term thinking requires us to seek feedback on the impact of our actions over time. We need to also shift from thinking that we're all separate islands or silos to one of connection and interdependence because we live in an interconnection, interconnected and interdependent world. Our current leadership and management, our base the theories and practice are based in separation. They prioritize the self-interest of the corporation over the impact of the organization's actions on the social and ecological well-being of our whole system and our whole planet. And we also need to shift from mechanistic organizational frameworks to living systems because our organizations are not machines filled with people we objectify and exploit as if they were cogs in a machine. Our organizations instead are filled with life and they operate like a living system found in nature. So leading for the commons requires all of our practices to shift towards regenerative outcomes and measures. My chapter in this book outlines how we can reimagine leadership that is regenerative and optimizes the whole system over a part of the system. And now I'd like to introduce Catherine Baird, the CEO of Ethics Game and author of chapter six, From Governance to Leadership, Ethical Foundations. Thank you, Kathleen. It's a privilege to be with you today and discuss the foundation of the commons, which is rethinking our understanding of ethics. As we begin to think of ethics, we often think of these big ideals that inform all that we do in our community. But in the commons, we are going to be thinking of ethics as shared understandings of behaviors that will govern us. And as Kathleen and others have said, this will require conversations with everybody on the commons. In order to do this work, however, we have to understand that our ethics are grounded in our values, values that are in tension. And as we study ethics, we have two primary tensions that are always going to appear that have to be resolved. The first tension is between the rights of the individual and the rights of the community as a whole. As we think about enclosures, often the rights of the individuals, the um, corporations and organizations have been privileged over the rights of the community as a whole to have access to those resources. And so that tension between the individual prerogatives and community needs and prerogatives has to be addressed. The other one is our head and heart. With our head, we put in place rules and regulations and processes and things that we can understand and ways we can understand about how best to live together. With our heart, we have flexibility and we can begin to change and adjust based on the needs of the community and the members of that community. So as we begin to think about how we are going to determine who's going to be in the community, who's gonna be part of the commons, what behaviors will not be tolerated and people will be asked to leave, we have a process that we can use that will help us with this discernment process. And that process involves conscious conversations. As we begin to think about these conversations, we begin down in the far left corner with this notion of paying attention, creating conscious spaces for us to be able to live and work together. So often we enter into conflict or understandings with each other from a prescribed point of view that we think we already understand instead of listening deeply to each other. As we move into the next place, we ask conscious conversations and conscious questions. What is going on? What do people need? What do they care about? What are the resources that they're bringing to the table? What are the behaviors that really will not be tolerated as we begin to move forward? And if we engage with the um, understanding of ethics as a set of questions to be asked as we navigate and negotiate together the behaviors that will let us live into our best understanding of ourselves, instead of prescribed rules that are going to be brought in from outside, the commons can then flourish and thrive and adjust as the needs of the people are there. The next place we then go into is to noticing the tensions and beginning to play with how do we hold these tensions together? How can we have conversations and be able to live within the contention long enough 
to have new ideas and new understandings evolve about how best we should be with each other. The skill of sitting in the tension, not rushing to resolution, nor moving away from it in fear or um, discouragement requires a great resilience of spirit. Once we've gone through this process of listening, once we have lived in the tension, often a new way, a novel way of working together will be resolved. And at that point, we act courageously, being willing to make mistakes, being willing to adjust as we go on, as we begin to think of how we can serve each other in this process. And once we go through the process, it's not done forever, but we listen, we reflect, we see where it worked, where it didn't work, and we go back through the process again. With this notion of ethics on the commons, it becomes fluid and changing as new situations come up, new problems that had never been envisioned come up. And it's a very grounded, practical way of doing ethics that requires that people listen to each other, care about each other, and then are willing to be wrong and engage in new ways of living together in community. And so with that very brief understanding of how ethics are formed in the commons, I would like to turn us now over to Gail Napier and David Willis, who will talk about their chapter on road warriors, communitas, and culture. Thank you, Catherine, for your important discussion of ethics on the commons. Our chapter looks at the experience of communitas among road warriors in the commons. We look at how complexity, emergence, ambiguity, and transformation exemplify our social and work worlds. The constructs of ritual, symbols, belonging, place, borders, boundary, and liminality help us to understand how communitas is formed and maintained. The commons are hybridized open spaces of knowledge and culture where sharing where sharing people can experience communitas. Thank you, Gayla. Our chapter explores how workers in distributed spaces create this communitas and function in a mobile, dynamic, and ever-changing commons. Our study reported on 21 road warriors, people who live on the borderlands of organizations and who work in reflexive environments of mobile liminality. Road warriors create communitas and practice commoning in what can be seen as distributed leadership in virtual or near virtual communities. Thanks, David. As leaders, we can develop a sense of belonging and communitas among our workforce. We can design and promote mindful interactions that support strong emotional belonging by holding space and creating the right environments. We can also develop meaningful rituals that promote belonging and support group identification. We can promote social activity that brings people together for networking, development, and time for socializing. One of the important suggestions that we have going forward from our study of Road Warriors is to encourage collaboration hubs and innovation centers where people can come together. We are already seeing this in many contexts. Moreover, developing fluid structures and processes that allow for the emergence of situational or distributed leadership is also a key recommendation from this research. Leadership is changing. We want to consider also the importance of place. Understanding place and the need to intentionally create and tend to place and places for and between people who are working and leading in the commons also reveals this new leadership. Road warriors provide a possible foretelling of a post-capitalist society, as Randall has shared with us. It is my pleasure now to introduce Katya Leb on behalf of herself, Miha Skerlavaj and Domen Rosman, authors of chapter 18, presenting on hopping the hoops or building a communal culture as the most significant pillar of leadership in the commons. Thank you, David. <laughs> After being introduced to some golden theoretical concepts that inform the leadership of the commons, I'm inviting you now into the midst of the, of the embodied story of the leadership of, of the commons. Duncan Devils, as seen on the picture, is a world-class acrobatic group defined by some admirable numbers. Funding num members teenage, 
more than 100 members and three generations in 15 years. Among best five groups worldwide, five continents, half a billion YouTube views by now. What marks this group special is that they decided for the leadership of the commons, not having the name for it, at the average age of 15 and no money in the pocket. So it is a real life example of the sense-making decision regarding the leadership style that endured the test of time and gave birth to a world-class free market organization. We analyze their story with grounded theory method, studying seven lines of data, eliciting governing leadership principles. As a backbone, we stated two concepts that stood out, communal culture and responsible leadership, and looked at the real life example that supported the underlying variables building these two concepts. This is what we found. Of five variables defining responsible leadership, Three are vastly informed by seven variables under the communal culture concept. The three aspects of responsible leadership, authenticity, responsibility, and international cross-cultural perspectives are abundantly supported by communal culture concept variables, which are putting high value on communal culture, sophistication of the documents, relations among the group agents, the team, as they call it, taking care of the offspring, core values, context of psychological safety and resilience. What we would like to especially emphasize is that this is very young people with zero leadership experience and embar embarking on a very risky and dangerous activity that allows little to no mistakes. Such leadership style has been chosen naturally and out of necessity. They did not have two chances at getting their story started right. What we today recognize as the leadership of the commons has naturally been their leadership of choice. This gives me a special confidence in the robustness of the concept leadership of the commons and the sustainable real life value this concept describes. Now I have a pleasure of inviting uh, Michael and Jan with their chapter 15 that calls Learning and Leading Together to Transform the World, Jesuit Higher Education and Ignatian Leadership Formation at the Margins. Please. Thank you, Katya, as well as Miha and Doman for your thoughtful reflections about communal culture. Speaking of communal culture, with May 2021 marking the beginning of a year of celebration of the 500th anniversary of the iconic transformation experience of St. Ignatius of Loyola, it is an opportune time to pause and reflect on how the founder of the Society of Jesus, and therefore ultimately the founder of the global network of nearly 200 Jesuit universities, has inspired contemporary Jesuits and their lay collaborators to harness their global presence and their humanistic, socially driven, and innovative approach to transformative tertiary education for the common good. Consequently, our chapter examines a collaborative partnership that was founded by lay and Jesuit collaborators in 2010 as the Jesuit Commons, a global learning initiative delivering higher education to refugees and internally displaced people. An alliance of three different independent nonprofit organizations based in Switzerland, the United States, and Germany, it is now known as Jesuit Worldwide Learning and provides higher education to people on the margins of society through a variety of learning formats, blending mobile, online, and on-site learning at its many learning centers, many of which are staffed by alumni who serve as learning center coordinators. You will meet three of them when you purchase the book, which by the way, makes for a great gift for a colleague or loved one. In the meantime, however, my co-author and colleague Jung will say a few words about Jesuit Worldwide Learning's decade of growth. Thank you, Michael, for that chapter overview and for our enduring collaborative partnership on scholarly projects such as this one on Jesuit Worldwide Learning, or JWL for short, 
Since its founding by an international coalition of Jesuit colleges and universities in 2010, JWL has developed into 60 community learning centers across three continents and 20 countries and has reached over 10,000 students from 40 nations. If you look at the map, you can see that as, as of August 2021, people at the margins of society are able to access higher education at JWL community learning centers in the following countries, Afghanistan, the Central African Republic, Chad, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Guyana, India, Iraq, Italy, Jordan, Kenya, Kyrgyzstan, Malawi, Myanmar, Nepal, the Philippines, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, South Sudan, Togo, Uganda, and Zambia. With regard to JWL's long-term sustainability, it is an open question as to how the knowledge commons that is Jesuit worldwide learning will endure as it relies on the generosity of committed university presidents and corporate partners. This will be important to monitor given the unexpected millions of dollars in coronavirus related spending by all organizations. Continued creativity, strategic planning, entrepreneurial innovation, and ongoing benefaction will be critical for ensuring the long-term vitality of Jesuit worldwide learning. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce Patricia Clary, author of Chapter 9, Convening Leadership on the Commons, Initiating Stakeholder Networks to Solve Complex Global Issues, to share with us. Take it away, Pat. Thank you so much, you and Michael, for expanding our horizons through your introduction of the Jesuit Worldwide Learning Centers. While Jung and Michael's chapter examined a collaborative partnership, my chapter examines collaboration through the lens of a convener. The word convene originated in the 15th century as a derivative of the Latin word convenir, meaning to come together, gather, unite, draw, or assemble. A significant role for the convener is to assemble, to bring all the stakeholders and shareholders to the table, and provide the leadership necessary to move the collaborative effort forward. This is not an easy process. Eleanor Ostrom, as referenced in Dr. Thompson's opening comments, developed those eight design principles that if incorporated in comedy would contribute significantly toward the success and sustainability of the collaborative effort. Convening leadership is about the individual that assembles the commoners, or stakeholders and guides them or leads them with governing principles. However, as noted by Dorado and other scholars, the effectiveness of conveners can depend on their credibility, their familiarity with the problem and their position as a balanced or unbiased party. These considerations become important factors as we sit down at the table and realize the shareholders and stakeholders may have competing agendas, different strategic pathways to arrive at the solution, governing regulations, or board members driving an agenda. I argue in chapter nine that convening leadership is the leadership required to bring multiple stakeholders to the table to develop a stakeholder network, solutions, and systems that are effective in solving complex global issues. In chapter nine, I discuss the convener, convening, challenges encountered in collaboration, and offer five dimensions in a convening leadership framework. And while I'm not able to go in depth in this presentation, the five skills conveners have to learn or will want to understand are how to facilitate collaboration of larger stakeholder networks, how the beliefs, values, and attitudes of the stakeholders factor into governing the commons. And Catherine Baird spoke about that in her and wrote about that in her chapter, how to develop and highlight cultural diversity as a positive trait, 
how to facilitate stakeholders to think outside of the box in solving problems, and how to use negotiation skills to bring congruity to the stakeholders. I have found reimagining leadership on the commons to be a purposeful, practical resource in addressing complex societal challenges. It has been a privilege to share in this effort with my esteemed colleagues. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kathleen Curran, author of chapter four, and as Randall already mentioned, co-author of the book, Reimagining Leadership on the Commons. And her chapter, Responsible, Relational, and Intentional, A Reimagined Construct of Corporate Commons Leadership. Kathleen? Thank you, Pat. Thank you very much for offering a powerful frame for collaboration bridging differences. The how for the what I am proposing in my chapter, a corporate commons hybrid structure that requires a reimagined leadership. In broad brush strokes, for hundreds of years, there has been a tendency for for-profit corporations and those practicing commoning beliefs to share an adversarial relationship, neither agreeing on what matters or how to reach that, clashing on four key questions that would require alignment for a proposed hybrid to be successful. First, what is the purpose of the entity? Is it profit and extraction from resources or protection of resources? Who has the right to resource ownership? Is it the individual corporation or a shared collective of global citizens? To whom does the entity owe responsibility? To shareholders or to the interconnected planet? And finally, how is time measured? Is it a short term with an emphasis on shareholder value or long term with an emphasis on sustainable care of shared resources? Theoretically, the proposed hybrid model is informed by three bodies of research responsible leadership, which promotes an inclusive, a uh, stakeholder relationship both inside and outside the organization to achieve a commonly shared business vision. Relational leadership that is based on a way of being in relation with others. Intentional leadership, a process that guides purpose, values, and beliefs. Together, these three redefine what profit means and to whom and for what the entity is responsible. Patagonia Inc. is a corporation that is an example of a hybrid model in practice. Their future orientation drives their present full business process. Founder Yvonne Chenard said, don't look at your footprint and what you left behind, look at your handprint and what you touch now. Therefore, they make conscious choices at every network point with sustainable prosperity in mind. That is at every link in their supply chain and in their sourcing partnerships. They also use the power of the collective aligned through a shared purpose, both internally through their people management processes and externally by connecting, mobilizing and supporting activism at community levels. In other words, the corporation equals the community and ecosystemically, ecosystemically redefines profit. So while this marriage may seem a paradox at first glance, my chapter argues that the time for leadership to tap the spirit of the commons and leverage the engines of the corporation has arrived. And now I will give us back to Randall to tie all our brilliant author's threads together. Thank you, Kathleen. As our authors have explained, the commons offers a way of self-organizing and self-governing that allows for a paradigm shift in the way we view the world and leaderships. We can help create a regenerative society by expanding our awareness and consciousness so that we can see whole human and non-human systems and their interactions from a higher perspective, such that we will have a more ethical perspective by understanding the broader implications of our actions and decisions we can meet together to define our values and our ways of working together based on care and responsibility and feel like we have greater control of our lives and of the future of our planet. 
We understand more the importance of communitas, of communal cultures, and of the Ubuntu philosophy that believes that I am because we are, and the importance of spreading care in the world through providing a common-centered education to marginalized groups throughout the globe. We can envision kinder and more responsible companies that adapt the ecocentric values of the commons, and we can have hope for a better tomorrow. We see that leadership is a shared process reflected in leadership behaviors, and that convening leaders have a special role of pulling us together to find our commonalities <clears throat> rather than our differences. The authors today have opened the door to a discussion of shifting the paradigm for a more ethical, equitable, and just world. And other authors in the book also not present today discuss other critical aspects of the commons. As you can see <clears throat> on the slide, there's Elizabeth Castillo's chapter that argues that commons leadership is bio-inspired and achieves dynamic stability in organizations by maintaining stability through dynamic change. Leadership, as she defines it, is a process that catalyzes the flow of energy, information, and matter through interdependent subsystems, creating stabilizing connectivity and coherence. Its relational process architecture, architecture promotes learning, adaptation, and dynamic coupling with the operating environment over time. Elaine Ula Benjoro's chapter shows how open access agricultural information systems are providing key previously enclosed information for women shareholder farmers in Africa to increase their production and help alleviate world hunger. Eden Ibrahim Fendik shows how formerly antagonistic women in Bosnia and Herzegovina united to protect their river from becoming a hydro dam and how a group of elite culturalists saved the National History Museum of Sarajevo. Patricia Greer's chapter shows how collective identity formation is a form of shared leadership and how it emerges from collaboration. Susie Ehrenrich shows how cultural and artistic commons are collaboratively led. Robin Vicious chapter shows how a commons to protect animals emerged and grew. Renato Souza's chapter shows how place-based leaders in the favelas of Brazil work to solve deep and disturbing problems that they have to solve outside of the state and or the private sector. Antonio Jimenez Luque shows that leadership is a meaning-making process and a process of collective action, as he shows in two organizations in Barcelona, which incidentally has become known as the leading city in the world um, focused on the commons. And he shows how these organizations have infused a more collaborative way of sharing resources in the city. Camila Vargas Este's chapter discusses challenges faced by community water commons in Chile. Windele Escobar shows how interorganizational collaboration is necessary now in these times of limited resources and the need to collaborate to solve our critical global problems. Jan Hurst challenges common scholars and activists by asserting that now is the time to develop a global job commons <clears throat> that will help provide jobs for everyone in the world. We invite you now to read our book. We hope that you'll buy it and engage in a conversation with us regarding how together we can continue to reimagine leadership and together create a better world. Thank you.